So, a uh, big last couple weeks, huh? A lot of changes. Hopefully a few more good ones to come, knock on wood. So, let's close out the Schlocktober roster this year in a big extended way. Not simply with one movie, but an entire franchise. <laughs> Okay, so the reason we don't usually get movies with a ton of sequels and related material on this subseries, except I think maybe like Puppet Master, <laughs> is because if they were popular and noteworthy enough to get that kind of spread, they probably wouldn't be obscure or unusual enough to make a good Schlocktober episode. But Attack of the Killer Tomatoes is somewhat unique in that, while it's managed to generate a pretty decent amount of media, and I feel like most people are vaguely aware that it exists, or at least they've heard the title floating around in the ether, not that many of those most people ever actually saw much, or like any of it. It's this strange artifact of late boomer, early generation X indie underground cult movie iconography that started out culturally ubiquitous without being tangibly omnipresent for an absurdly long time, given what it was, then got to be actually everywhere for a hot second at the start of the 90s when it seemed like anything vaguely memorable could be turned into a merchandising thing. We need Rambo! Rambo. Rambo and General Warhawk with their battle action weapons, each sold separately. And then, well, okay, it turned out maybe everything but this, and yet it's still kicking around, seemingly on the strength of no way for real that can't be a real movie, still working after all these years. But okay, here's how this happened. While taking a film class in the mid-70s at UC Davis, a trio of friends, John DeBello, Costa Dillon, and Stephen Peace, shot a 15-minute spoof of 50s-style monster movies called Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, apparently with the initial intent of riffing on the Japanese horror classic Matango, which had been released in the US as Attack of the Mushroom People. was well received, and later, having gone into business as a budget film production company, they opted to take a shot on an original feature by expanding the idea to theatrical length. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes! Attack of the Killer Tomatoes! They'll beat you, bash you, squish you, mash you, chew you up for brunch, and finish you off for dinner or lunch. The result was effectively a bad-on-purpose, intentionally low-budget takeoff on disaster-style monster movies, but with a broad and decently-mined bit of satire where the typically competent, effective government-military response to the monster as depicted in the played-straight 50s versions is replaced by gridlocked, malfunctioning 70s bureaucracy. You know whose ass is on the line? Yours. Mine and the entire we egg department. <laughs> yeah. I won that one in a three-legged sack race last Armed Forces Day picnic. What's the matter with General Number Two? Oh, he was out all night on maneuvers. Let him rest. The Senate Investigating Committee is called to order. Anybody remember what we are supposed to be investigating? I apologize for the size of this room, gentlemen. It's, it's, it's uh, all I can do on such short notice. Beyond that, it's basically a one-joke movie. Here's a stock scene from a monster movie you recognize, but instead of a monster, tomato. <laughs> They tell it differently enough in enough different ways that it doesn't wear out the welcome. They incorporated this actual helicopter stunt gone wrong into the movie because miraculously nobody got hurt, so it wasn't in bad taste to do so, which makes it look more expensive than it actually was. And believe it or not, this actually made it out before airplane. And I would argue that the escalation reveal is kind of a legitimately brilliant joke. I'm afraid, gentlemen, that what we have here before us isn't what we thought. You don't mean... This? May God help us. It's a cherry to me.
So it's basically an innocuous, fun, goofy prank of a movie. They finished it, they sold it, they released it into distribution where it did pretty good business on the drive-in and small theater circuit, particularly in the American South and Midwest, and in part because it could play as a midnight movie and a mostly safe kid matinee movie since it wasn't actually all that gory, adult, or even dark humor. Dr. Nokotafu, would you uh, please explain the project to the gentleman? What we have developed is, in essence, a half-man, half-robot, a very sophisticated combination of human intelligence and superhuman powers, which we are confident will result in the ultimate destruction of the enemy. You better bring your coat. There's a little Jap in the air. He needs nip. <sighs> With the obvious exception, of course, that it wouldn't be an otherwise good movie from the 70s if there wasn't at least one cringe-inducing racist joke that just absolutely would and should not fly today. But otherwise, deals got closed up, everybody made their money, that should have been the end of it, but then the first of two implausible events happened. Right around that same time, film critic, early trash cinema connoisseur, and yes, future embarrassing right-wing nutcase Michael Medved and his brother Harry found out about Attack of the Killer Tomatoes and approached Costa de Bello in peace about getting a print of the film for a festival based around then recent book, The 50 Worst Movies Ever Made. And they agreed on the condition that their film be awarded the title specifically of the worst movie ever made about vegetables. Across the length and breadth of the nation, the tomatoes continue on their rampage of wanton destruction. Even the mere mention of the word is sufficient to induce panic. Tomato. The Medved brothers agreed, and this stunt got the name of the film into the national small press, then the national big press, local and national media started reporting on, basically, hey, did you know that there's a real movie out there called Attack of the Killer Tomatoes? Isn't that funny? As a feel-good human interest story, late-night comedy hosts started doing jokes about it, and had people associated with the production on the shows, and basically, yeah, this was Sharknado before Sharknado. The campy, over-the-top sci-fi original movie is tearing through the Twitterverse with a bite. At its peak, more than 5,000 hashtag Sharknado tweets per minute. The Twitter buzz around Sharknado surpassed even the Red Wedding. Hollywood stars, cult and bandwagon fans, and critics alike all had something to say. This one's pretty funny. Even Red Cross Oklahoma took to Twitter with, if it were to happen, it would be in Oklahoma. Why? because we're tough like that. I think we're just all stunned that we did something right. A social media blockbuster in a summer full of flops. Except where Sharknado got to cash in on the improbable hyper-awareness right away because of the social media age, the Killer Tomatoes basically went dormant once people found, you know, other random silly stuff to laugh at, and everyone involved went back to their regular business. For the filmmakers, that went back into mostly commercial short filmmaking and sports reels. And then it was about a full decade until improbable event number two, which involved, I shit you not, the Muppet Babies. <laughs> Okay, so to keep this at a reasonable length, one of the reasons the whole anything can be a merchandise powerhouse if you push it hard enough ethos became so prominent in the 80s is that when the Hollywood studio machine was rebuilding itself at the end of the 70s, it was doing so largely out of a crop of quick-thinking new young executives who, with the previous system somewhat in ruins when they were starting their careers, had to do their early breaking in in the low-budget exploitation movie game under longtime B-list pros like Roger Corman and Sam Arkoff. Corman himself specifically had parlayed that into a solid midlife second wind as the head of New World Pictures, which had a pretty good success as a budget film label, but really solid success for a while as a television brand. One of its prized subsidiaries was the animation studio Marvel Productions, the rebranded name of the former DePatty Freeling Animation Studios because that was the sort of business deal Marvel was striking back then, which in turn produced the original 80s animated shows based on various Marvel Comics properties, Transformers, G.I. Joe, My Little Pony, many others, and Muppet Babies, which had a gimmick of incorporating live-action movie footage into the characters' dream and make-believe sequences, and in 1987, the episode The Weird Weirdo Zone made one of those movie references, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. We interrupt this cartoon for a special bulletin. Silly tomatoes are attacking everywhere looking for lousy comedians. <laughs> Waka waka waka! 
That episode, in turn, became one of the better received of that season, and apparently generated an uptick in interest in whatever the movie with the big tomatoes was among the show's audience significant enough for the producers to take notice, and as one would expect from a company birthed by Roger Corman himself, their initiative was to call up the filmmakers and ask, hey, do you want to make a sequel? So ten years later, yet yeah, they actually did Return of the Killer Tomatoes, which picks up an in-universe ten years after The Tomato Wars, and is this time all about mad scientist Dr. Gangrene, played by John Astin, using mad science to evolve tomatoes into humanoid super soldiers, and also one would-be sex slave for himself named Tara Bumdier. You wouldn't believe what she can do with six milk bottles and a tuning fork. <laughs> Uh, that's Karen Mastow, later Karen Waldron. You might remember her from Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death and recurring guest roles on Baywatch and Coach in the 90s, who instead escapes and joins up with the good guys, mainly the nephew of one of the heroes from the original movie. You were sex now? Yes. No. Did you maybe fall down and bump your head hard? Um, you know, maybe did your mother drop you when you were a baby? Do you speak much English? I speak perfect English. I also cook 815 international dishes, perform 637 sexual acts, and use all the popular home appliances. Shall I cook you something? <laughs> and his friend played by some actor named George something, who I'm sure nobody ever heard from again. Thank you. That's I had a heck of a time finding you here. I told you I'd be at the shoe store. You think your buddy, you think your pal, your roommate Schmuck. here. What, you think that I'm going to leave you out in the cold? You yes. think that I'm going to leave you out in the cold? No? All right. Well, then, how about, uh, see those over there? That's Tiffany. There's room for another judge. No, thanks. If I want a girl, I don't need your help. Okay, all right. Suit yourself, suit yourself. <laughs> uh, ladies, did I mention the Playboy centerfold opportunity? Whereas the original was more of a National Lampoon, Zucker Brothers style genre spoof, this was more of a straight comedy spoofing on Spielbergian 80s fantasy action trope, common to the era, dorky hero, oversex buddy, out of his league damsel, even a merchandisable sidekick animal in F.T. the Fuzzy Tomato. Not nearly as inspired as the first one, but there's fun to be had and the cast all seem to know exactly what kind of movie they're in. What do you really know about tomatoes anyways, huh? I mean, how would you feel if you'd been raised to be eaten? Wouldn't you rebel at the first opportunity? You will never know what it is to love or be loved. Emotions are for people, not vegetables. The driver is following us, or her. But I think you're imagining things. I don't imagine garbage trucks. The mouth, perfect. The eyes are never right. Professor Gangrene? What? This is real life. This isn't some game. Honey. Take my quad runner. Well, if you take your quad runner from Honda of San Diego, I'll take my quad runner. We will each take a Honda quad runner from Honda of San Diego. They have excellent acceleration and superb rideability. And aren't they number one in sales, Matt? That's right, Chad. Not to mention great gas mileage. And did you know that? Do Honda we have enough money to finish this turkey yet? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, give them hell, guys. And once again, yeah, this ended up doing shockingly good business for New World on home video, so this time the producers, director John DiBello and his crew, opted to try and rig the rag out and see just how much juice was actually in there, using the same formula as other suddenly popular underground properties like the Toxic Avenger and Ninja Turtles were using at the dawn of the 1990s. 
Yeah, they did a cartoon and a line of action figures, mostly based on expanding the premise of Return to actually feature the giant tomatoes again, and this time giving them faces like they'd had on the posters and personalities, costumes, various powers, etc. The toys were cute, and the show was not without its charms, though it ultimately only ran two seasons, the first of which did decent ratings, and the second of which did not. But that first successful season, and the overall, the first two made money and don't cost a lot proof of concept, got the Tomatoes as actual characters now aesthetic carried over into two more sequels. No, really. <laughs> Killer Tomatoes Strike Back is probably the least of the franchise, unfortunately, a sort of meandering neo-noir spoof and kind of toothless satire of early 90s media trends with Dr. Gangrene masquerading as a Geraldo Rivera, Phil Donahue hybrid TV talk host doing a mind control with TV satellite thing. You'll never get away with this, Geronahue. Get away with it, Mr. Boyle? I already have. I've kidnapped every member of the media. Have a look, see what they've resorted to. From Washington, it's the evening news. Americans would watch a chimp read the news. They are watching a chimp read the news. Oh, the tomatoes, they're going into a beaning frenzy. Beaning frenzy? They hate to wait for food. You should see them at wedding receptions. These days, it's mostly remembered for the retroactive quirk of future Who Wants to Marry a Millionaire reality TV goon Rick Rockwell playing the new lead hero, and this one really, really shitty joke. If you want the best, forget the rest. Look at them. They're completely hypnotized by that commercial. When you purchase the That's it! That They've been reprogrammed with bad television! What would you pay for all this? Don't answer, because if you order before midnight tonight, we're going to throw in absolutely free a copy of K-Smell's biggest selling album, Mike Tyson's Greatest Hits. March 7th, Bone Crusher Smith. June 27th, Michael Spinks. August 1st, Robin Givens. Oof. Man, the... 90s really were both a long time ago and yet, unfortunately, not that long of a time ago. However, things do end on, if not a high note, at least a better note with the Killer Tomatoes Eat France. Professor Mortimer Gangrene, Tomato Mastermind, Scourge of Civilized Society, is to be freed at once! What's your guys You wanna do what then? Wow. Well done, lads. Well done. Popery, soup du jour. which has probably the most elaborate-looking production of the series, and does an entertaining enough goof at the expense of the Man in the Iron Mask. True King of France shall return with the sun. Behold, the future King of France. Professor, it's... It's me! Yes, it's you! <laughs> No, I am Louis, but my friends call me Franchi. Here, look. Streets run red, the uh, waters don't flow, sun don't shine, virgin weeps. King comes back. That's you. No wonder my last name is 17th. And other things vaguely French associated and also pulled from the animated series as a callback. Well, it appears 
appears to be a giant, slobbering, somewhat overweight tomato with a cape and mask. It's... it's Fan Tomato of the Opera! Ah! Back off! You overgrown piece of produce! Ah! Holy so as to go out with some pretty solid laughs overall. That is, of course, a big square and round thing, built by someone to remember something, sometime. Ah, the famous left bank of Paris! That is a big, tall building with lots of knickknacks and stuff. It's almost finished. This is Napoleon's tomb. None of it ever tops the first one, of course, but, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's all just fun that this both exists in the first place, and it seems to have happened for the most part, without anybody getting screwed out of any rights, or the creators hating each other for whatever reason, or, you know, the kind of disasters that usually befall these semi-obscure, bizarre success stories. <laughs> Some people did a thing mostly for a laugh, it implausibly turned into a pop culture institution in a couple decades, modest profit and minor fame for most of the people involved, and most of what came out of it was just fun and silly and people had a good time with it. You know, that's, that's kind of nice. We can work this out, I just need some time. I love you as much as ever, darling, please believe me. That's sort of one of the happier endings we get to these stories. Sometimes things can just be good good things can still happen. And I guess, uh, yeah, I guess I felt like we needed to hear that again this year. More than ever. Happy Halloween, everybody, and thanks for watching Schlocktober.